Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode nine of the Technological Podcast. In episode nine, we bring on guest Chandra Pathuri, who's currently in the business planning and strategy division over at Facebook, where he leads business planning and strategy for Facebook's small and medium business sales teams. In this episode, we really wanted to focus on you know, the outbound go to market side of things, where Chandra is currently at, where he sits in the intersection of sales, product marketing, and product management. And his job is to really help. Um, effectively drive sales revenue targets, help them s- s- be strategic about their day-to-day and their processes so that they can um, a- achieve some of those overall targets and goals that they're uh, set up for. Uh, but we really wanted to focus on diving into how Chandra has gotten here today, all the way from his first job in investment banking over at Goldman Sachs, much more finance-heavy role than going over to at and and Dell, where he was more on the enterprise B2B side of things, but still on the outbound sales side of things. So we hope this episode will be helpful for some of you that might be in finance or management consulting and looking to break into technology or software, where there is still such a need for people with uh, your kinds of backgrounds and skill sets. So as always, if you enjoyed the podcast, please like, subscribe, and share. It really helps us. Hello, and welcome, everyone, to episode nine of the Technological Podcast. Um, Here today, we have special guest Chandra Pathuri, who is joining us uh, from the BizOps world and strategy side of things uh, from Facebook. And so to kick us off here, Chandra, why don't you just walk us through or just give us an introduction um, into yourself? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, having me on. Um, Yeah, elevator pitch time. No, just kidding. Uh, So... Originally from Illinois, I've, you know, bounced around the country. I went to Penn for undergrad, um, was a fi- uh, studied finance there, kind of took a classic path to start my career in banking. Um, you know, great place, built a good analytical foundation. I think every banking analyst goes to, through kind of a personal moment of like, is finance and a long-term career path in finance for me or not? And it's, it's pretty binary. And the folks that uh, choose the, you know, no, it's not option kind of have to think about where to go from there. The path isn't as structured as going into the buy side and getting a, you know, a B school degree, et cetera. And so I went through that same process around 2013, which was, you know, seven, eight years ago, um, found myself down to Texas for corporate gigs. So I've been in Texas for the past seven, eight years, working across like pretty, you know, large cap telecom first, and then more recently tech, companies um as a niche uh referred to in a biz opsy world so that's that's a quick background on me nice so let's uh let's start off you know you're an undergrad you're at penn there are you know tons of smart people ambitious people looking to get a bunch of different jobs like what was the culture like what kind of jobs were people looking at getting and and what were you kind of thinking about in terms of the first job that you wanted to get yeah, so flashing back, I, I was in college 07 to 11. So it was a very interesting time because of the 2008 global financial crisis. So a lot of our upperclassmen struggled with getting job offers or getting job offers rescinded when, like, I mean, we saw, like, I think a 40% dip um, in the S&P 500 from high to trough. Uh, but I will say, I think, you know, the culture at Penn, um, I don't know if it's changed in the past decade, is there is a lot of fear of failure. Uh, you have a lot of former valedictorians, salutatorians coming in. They're used to being top of their class. They're used to having very me- easily measured, me- easily measured, um, you know, KPIs for success. And so I think that leads to a lot of herd mentality to go into banking, consulting. And at Penn, we're even privileged enough to make the direct jump to buy side. You know, working at a private equity firm or a hedge fund, and you saw like a, a small percentage of people do that as well. We did have some this, like specific specialized programs, which were like dual degrees in, you know, engineering and business, like called um, technology management or technology and management. And there was like a very small percentage of folks that went down a path of like startup or like something that felt like tri- like off the beaten path. Um, but a lot of folks just kind of like followed their 
way into banking or consulting. And I think part of it is this kind of, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's just like this optionality obsession. It's this weird, like you just want optionality always. It's like this weird, like how many call options can I collect because I'm only 18, I'm only 20, I'm only 22. And, you know, I saw an interesting article from a Harvard Business School professor a couple, maybe a year or so ago where he's like, you know, we're obsessed with collecting optionality cards, but we're not really thinking about what we want to do. So I'll kind of pause there. And that was, that was, to be honest, I'm being candid, the governing principle to go into banking consulting because it's low risk. You're going to be well-trained and then you'll have exit opportunities. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think that kind of echoes some of the um, experiences we had over at, at, at Georgia Tech. Um, I know, you know, my, my peers who were in engineering degrees um, were very, very uh, focused on getting into, you know, consulting over on the, I was in the computer science program. So lots of focus on, you know, how do I go work at Microsoft or Google or Facebook as a, as a software engineer. Um, but, you know, a lot of focus on optionality, um, but great. And, and, you know, while you were going through your, your degree over at um, Penn, were, were there specific things that interested you kind of outside of coursework? Um, yeah. You know, like that, that led you into did the career that you were taking, or was it more of a culture thing that kind of drove you that way? Yeah, no, I, I think perhaps opened a little cynically strong. I love corporate finance, right? So I think like math was my favorite subject or up there with history in high school. And it naturally segued into applying very mathematic concepts of intersecting accounting, you know, three statement principles and analysis into how to value companies, how to value stocks. And so like all the theory that underlies that, and there is a lot of it, um, really interested me. And so I constantly found myself, you know, I used to TA for the finance department. I had the cool privilege of TAing an executive MBA class for an introductory corporate finance course, which gave me exposure to folks that were 10, 15 years into their careers. And I think like through all of those experiences, at least when I was like 20, 21 years old, junior, senior in college, the world of corporate finance really interested me. It connected with my kind of leaning, like past leanings into mathematics into sort of a real world business application. So to me, that was, that, that really drove me a niche initially into finance. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's, let's fast forward a little bit. You are at Goldman, you know, you yeah. not only like there's, there's a lot of culture and, and interest of, you know, people, uh, you know, in your class and, and around your age trying to get into banking. Um, and so, you know, you got into banking and you had a great interest in it. Like what was your day to day like, and, and, and kind of talk about it in the lens of like how that day to day almost sets you up for the tech roles that you're in now yeah. or the business business roles that you're in at, to, at these tech companies. I uh, would love to know that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, look, banking was an amazing training grounds, just amazing, right? Everyone knows it's a, it's a busy and stressful job, but like the skills that you are forced to pick up, um, you know, in a rapid fashion, uh, whether it be analytical skills within Excel. So taking really messy raw input of, you know, maybe files from companies like external research reports and translating that into digestible and cogent spreadsheets that lend themselves to presentations that are going to CEOs and CFOs and heads of corporate development. And this being, you know, three to six months into the job, like just absolutely terrific training grounds. And then I think you also, just by virtue of how lean deal teams are, it's, it's a managing director, a VP associate and analyst. It's a four or five person. We might bring in someone from the financing side, but you're talking about maybe five, 10 people from your company, like advising multi-billion dollar companies on selling themselves, buying other companies, raising equity, raising debt. And so just being there, it's almost funny, like even beyond the, like the tangible skills, just the exposure to the conversations that happen in pretty senior executive forums, like it teaches you, it teaches you how, you know, a successful career in business requires you to be so interdisciplinary. It's, it requires you to work smart, not work hard. Like the whole end point of any business, like kind of exercise is impact and outcomes, not like my Excel spreadsheet looks really well formatted or my presentation has the perfect color coding. Like those are the accentuating points that show your attention to detail. They're more signaling to the quality of your work, but really like, um, you know, I remember one of the top analysts in my group, I was in tech media telecom at Goldman, like it was such a lean team that he was interfacing directly with the CEO of Sprint. 
right? Like here's a 23 year old directly interfacing with Sprint on arguably the most transformational deal of their company's history and uh, potentially acquiring T-Mobile, which eventually happened about, I think like 20 years later or 10 years later, but it just speaks to, so I think to answer your question, it's, it's the intangibles really, Saren. Like you're gonna pick up the analytical skills. You come in oftentimes recruited from very strong academic backgrounds. But I think it's like going that step beyond and realizing like it's this is not a nine to five job. This is not like finish X, Y, Z, like tangible tasks and then like submit it and go home. You're you're talking and influencing some really senior people, you know, and that's and that skill and forming it so early in your career really sets you ahead when if and when you choose to shift to a you know slightly um, I wouldn't say slower, but like more um, moderate pace corporate environment. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that kind of experience is, and I've heard from so many mentors and other people that getting that executive experience, learning how to talk to them, learning how to present what matters, um, really like help can help you, can set you apart and help you learn a ton. And you see that in a lot of roles in tech today, like, um, you know, uh, one part of product marketing, which is, which is what I'm in is prepping executives for, to, to meet with journalists, to give presentations, like, um, stuff like that. And, and, and even like on the product management side, it's like, you know, how can we influence and, and build, uh, you know, an idea and try and get a bunch of people on board across the company. And so, um, yeah, those skills are, are really uh, transferable. Um, so then, you know, pivoting into, uh, you know, you thinking, you know, you're at Goldman for, you, you yeah. said two years, right? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so you're there for two years. Were you, intentionally looking to, to leave? What, what were you kind of yeah. thinking at that point? Yeah. So this will, this will kind of like not derail, but segue into more kind of a personal life application here, which is why I think it's important for me to provide this personal context because it doesn't necessarily inform the classic path out of finance into tech biz ops. Like if I controlled for like all other preferences, the best move probably would have been to go to at the time a Facebook or a Google maybe Amazon in kind of like a level two business operations role. Like that would have been the most obvious play. But but then this is where the personal application comes in. Like I grew up in a very small town in Illinois. And I think it's that cliche of like, you can take, you know, the, the boy out of the small town, but you can't take the small town out of the boy. Like New York never fit on me. And I perhaps my notion here was, um, you know, maybe like not like completely accurate, but at the time, like switching to SF into the new tech world wouldn't provide the downshift of kind of like culture and lifestyle I was seeking. And that's why Texas became sort of like a non-negotiable. Like I had family down there and I love the warmer climates. I grew up in India and Australia for the first 10 years of my life. And so like, that's why I'm saying all of these disparate personal preferences informed my view, look into Texas. Now at the time in Texas, you know, Houston had an oil and gas sector. Um, Dallas had some more traditional companies like, you know, AT&T, Kimberly, Clark, Verizon with major operations. Austin was still had all its old techs, like not old tech, but like older companies. So your semiconductor companies, your Dells, um, IBM, Big Blue, but new tech hadn't really emerged. So like Fang, Indeed, like these companies were still in very nascent stages um, at the point in time that I was looking to come down. And so for me, I'd worked on a lot of telecom deals when I was at in my golden group. I hadn't worked as much on tech, to be honest. And even if when I did, it was semiconductor companies. So my exposure to the internet sector was pretty minimal at the time. So internet, SaaS, fintech, like just not space. That was often run out of the SF Goldman TMT office more so than the New York one. Um, so yeah, I mean, at t just like, and I can kind of, I think like it was in kind of the agenda we talked about, like, how did you make the jump? How did you potentially, I just looked for jobs online. And then I employed the same networking strategies that I used to as an undergrad, which is like, look people up in LinkedIn, reach out. Um, some, I was a bit fortuitous that I networked with a hiring manager for a role that I was looking at. Um, and um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but you know, what really helped is I looked at what kind of roles was I looking at? The, there were not really a lot of traditional pre MBA roles at these older tech telecom companies for what I did. And like, I, I was not at all interested in going in as just a pure corporate analyst um, because it just, it didn't match up with like the skill set and how far along I was already like, you know, 18 to 24 months into banking. So I was aggressive in pursuing like post MBA positions 
and I was fortunate enough to to nab one at AT and T. You know, as I said, I would be lying if I said that you know the company and the growth prospects were the main governing you know principles in my choice. It wasn't right. It was it was a bit of lifestyle, family, and uh, and to be honest, a, a bit of recuperation after two pretty intense years in banking. Um, but yeah, I'll pause there. That that was such a key moment and pivotal moment in my career. Yeah, no, that's great, and I think it's it's helpful to highlight some of those um, you know those intangibles around. Uh, you know, things that, that you value outside of, you know, just work and, and a, a total, you know, kind of shift as well outside of, um, you know, your career and things and that that kind of factored into your decision. And so, so you switch from from Goldman, you know, high, high paced, um, intense banking environment, you now come to AT&T, um, a sort of bigger, maybe slower moving, you know, corporation, yeah. you know, what was your role kind of, you know, what were you intended to, to be brought in to do? What was that like? Yeah. You know, what, you know, what was your kind of day to day like? Yeah. Here's a headline on AT&T. So I, part of even picking AT&T was I, I felt like I got the best of both worlds. So they set up an office 20, 20 miles North of like downtown Dallas HQ and they called it emerging business markets. And it was funny because they were really trying to mimic the look and feel of SF. It was uh, floor to ceiling glass conference rooms. People could wear uh, casual attire to work, which is like so like taboo in traditional AT&T mothership. Um, people were on scooters, like going around in scooters. There were like free snack piles. Like it, they really were going for that feeling. Um, that said, like, I think like, you know, there was still that old culture. A lot of the folks were just shifted from the mothership to this office. So it's not like you can completely reinvent yourself. Um, I was brought in to help set up an indirect sales channel targeting um, small and medium businesses uh, to sell the stack of at and solutions. So like telecom solutions, mobile solutions. So just anything an enterprise needs from a telecom and mobile services perspective uh, to run their business. And the, the value prop of this go to market was like, it didn't make sense to have like a full-time employee uh, at and salesperson to manage some of these accounts, we, we would lack the breadth of coverage. Therefore, this indirect sales channel where we partnered with what we called solution providers, which in more um, standardized industry terms would be VARs, value added resellers, they would take our sort of white box at and solution component and pair their services or their ongoing management or whatever it might be on top. So it was kind of like a win-win of we, ha we gave them a transfer pricing. And so we made perhaps a lower margin than selling to the end user and enterprise ourselves. But we had a lower kind of cost on the sales and marketing sides, working in a much more lean way where like you could hit 20 endpoint SMBs, but you're working through one bar. So like we only had to maintain the VAR relationship and uh, um, enable them or position them for success. And so my specific role was basically the entire um, business and financial strategy behind it. So it, it's it, like whatever my title was on day one of work, it quickly morphed into becoming sort of a strategic ch chief of staff to the head of this new go-to-market business unit. And it was very self-contained. It had its own sales, its own finance, its own marketing, its own everything. And it was intended to be that way. It was supposed to be a company within a company to think new, to break from like, you know, mothership norms. So it was kind of cool, this hundred person organization, almost autonomous startup within the company. And I was probably uh, in a you know, small group of three, four people that really directed things from a data-driven strategic perspective. Cool. Yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty good timing because we just finished up recording a podcast uh, with the chief of staff at a different company. So I'm yeah. sure our, our listeners will get to see, you know, what, what that chief of staff is doing and then, and then, uh, you know, draw some parallels to what you're doing at at and um, So, so, you know, you're, you're at at and for how long again? Couple years. Couple years. So did you get the itch? Were you ready to go somewhere yeah. else? What, what were you thinking there? Yeah, I think everybody kind of reaches a, a learning curve. It's kind of an S curve, right? With learning, like with any job, like initially you feel like you're just kind of treading water, trying to just stay afloat. And then suddenly there's a huge ramp. Like you pick up a ton of context, you become a SPE in your specific functional area. And then it levels off again. It's just natural. Like that's just how jobs go. And you have to challenge yourself to either you know, expand your scope within the role itself, um, move up within the organization, move around within the organization. And so like for me, I took a very objective lens to like, could I continue to expand my scope here, build on my skill set? And, and I also decided to look externally. And so once again, fortuitous timing, like 
a lot of my job decisions have come because of networking. So there was a Wharton MBA who was starting up a new team and it was super cool. They were going to be essentially the chief of staff to the head of enterprise sales at Dell. So which is pretty crazy position. So Dell splits into a consumer business and an enterprise business. The enterprise business at the time was a run rate of $15 billion. And there was a head of sales for that um, organization. And they were looking to staff a pretty lean, kind of almost an internal McKinsey Bain uh, that ran operations, strategically directed the sales organization while interfacing with the product organization. And so essentially biz ops, like in a nutshell. And and yeah, it worked out because I was almost became the chief of staff to the chief of staff, which at that point I was like 25 years old. I had four years of experience, two in banking, two at AT&T. I had broadened my scope at AT&T from like, oh, this is just like another post MBA kind of analytical resource to someone who's looked to in higher stakes environments. One key example being AT&T had just closed the acquisition of DirecTV around 2014 um, when I was still there. And they just pulled me in almost kind of pro bono, like on a weekend to come in and do revenue modeling of like, how do you combine AT&T's revenue streams with uh, DirecTV's revenue streams is because, and, and like I superseded a large corporate finance organization of employees, more senior people than me, because I was able to show that kind of up level impact, which is a skill I picked up at Goldman. I think the most important skill in my career, which is influencing without authority, right? Your ability to manage parallel, manage up um, is so key in this world. And I think that was identified at AT&T and then, and it just, I just continued to build that muscle coming to, um, coming to Dell where like, you know, Brad was my manager, this sort of chief of staff to the head of enterprise sales. And I being his sort of day-to-day go-to by proxy was still like almost had like the, like strategic operational reins of this multi-product $15 billion um, enterprise hardware company that was going through a sweeping industry change with the, with the um, influx of cloud, right? And so for me, I just, you had to, right? At that point, there's no more, like you are the person. You, it's one of those things where you, I don't even get to ask like, what's the deadline for this project? It's like, I am the engagement manager. And my, my manager essentially functioned as sort of like an exec sponsor of a consulting engagement. And we were internal consultants to a uh, sales organization. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think the theme, one of the themes you, you've kind of mentioned here is a lot of these new roles have come through networking, right? And, yes. and understanding you know, um, or reaching out to people who are either in your immediate network or in, you know, network of of their network and and really trying to um, talk with them first and understand what the role is about and how you can add value um, as opposed to maybe just cold applying to (laughs) a a bunch of different roles and and falling uh, face first. Um, No, that's great. And you you threw out this word, uh, biz ops. Do you mind um, explaining that you know, in, in a little bit more context um, of what yeah. that means. Absolutely. And, you know, it has different names at different companies. I've, I'm in it at Facebook right now. I was in it at Dell. I'd argue at at t even though it wasn't called that, it may as well have been. Um, so at, at Dell, it was called like the center of competence, which is a funny name. You, you think they'd call themselves center of excellence at least. But either way, in a nutshell, I think of BizOps as the connective tissue within any um tech commercial organization. So any tech company, the key pillars that they often have are like you have your you know, product side, you have your sales side, two big pillars that make everything go. Marketing is there as well. Finance is there as well. So I, I'm, I'm sort of being reductive here. There's so much more nuance, but I think it's more, I want to talk in a scalable fashion. Think of these four pillars and they each have different goals. Like product is like working close with upstream engineering on 18 month roadmaps and like what product features to, to fit with the, the market that you're targeting, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Sales is so like, just what's my quarterly target? What's my monthly target? Like, how do I grow the book of business? Marketing comes in and it's interesting place. They develop collateral, they're developing customer demos. Like they're trying to position the product. Like marketing is so important because you learn in any business education that value is so intangible. There is no objective truth of value. A lot of it comes from coaching or kind of convincing your target base um, into the perceived value of any of your offerings. 
And then finally, finance is there to be the checks and balances, right? They're setting like corporate finance goals around revenue growth, cash flow, operating income, um, how much capital expenditure a business might need. And so they're kind of keeping an eye on uh, on the finances. And so what happens is these four organizations are all marching on different cadences, on different priorities, and biz ops slots perfectly right between, right? I would say like, depending on the company, like it, it could be different, but I will say we're most close in those four pillars. We're most closely orbiting sales. I'd say um, we're trying to, we're basically the strategic chiefs of staff to sales. We set goals for them. We give them, you know, plans to achieve their goals. And we sort of provide cover for them in the sense, or not cover, but like we take a lot of their field feedback into these other organizations. Hey, marketing, like the message, the in in initial outbound message is not landing or it's not reaching the right people or hey, finance, like we need investment. We need a big bet on putting up a big investment in some kind, whatever it may be to expand the market or to double down within an existing market. And then and ultimately back to product as well, right? Like what is the like the flywheel of feedback of like products that need to be developed um, based on the feedback coming from sales. And so like, I, I think of biz ops as the strategic chiefs of staff to sales, but with very direct lines and connection with the other three key functional pillars. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation of, of how biz ops works and how it is the connective tissue. And for any of our listeners who are, you know, who, who want to start off in consulting or banking, or just want to go like the very business side of tech, like biz ops is, is probably like the, the best area that you should go. If you want to be more technical, there's product. Um, you know, if, if you're really into like, you know, what kind of features should we build? You know, there's product and, and software engineering. You want to build collateral that's marketing, but like, you know, if you want to really stay on the business and, and, and analysis and operational side of things, like biz ops is, is the place to go. So um, yeah, that was awesome to hear that explanation. Uh, so, you know, transitioning into Facebook, um, yeah. would, lo would love to know, you know, how did you go about getting that job? I'm sure you did a lot of networking there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then also, you know, once you're at Facebook, once you're in this role, uh, can you give us a, 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 an idea of, you know, what your team looks like, um, what you're chartered with and, you know, your department or uh, focus that, because Facebook's obviously a, a huge company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, look, I when I was I was ready to kind of make a jump into a faster growth environment. Um, you know, at the time Dell had just acquired EMC, it was like a $65 billion tech merger. There's a reason it was the largest tech deal of all time. Like tech companies maybe should or shouldn't um, merge at that scale. It's really complicated and messy. Um, and it was going to be a five-year company transformation. And a lot of my, anytime two companies merge, you, you see a lot of um, attrition. And so my sponsorship stack of VPs and senior VPs had moved on and I wasn't fully interested in following them. They went to, a, you know, traditional companies as well um, on the older end, 30, 40 years old companies. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm ready. It's time. Like it felt like the fan companies, like I wasn't ready in the past, or, or at least that was a self-perception. They're mature enough. I think they could benefit from the skill set that I would bring from a more traditional mature company environment. Um, and that was always my view. Like I, I wasn't sure like a, like a pre IPO series, a B type company was the best skill fit because I, we all figure out what is our special skill. And like, you know, I love the analytical foundation that I built at Goldman, but, um, I'm also not like a junkie for SQL and Tableau. I'm hyper proficient in it, but I'm not like, it's not something that gets me out of bed every day. Like I want to amplify my impact. And that means being in the rooms where executive decisions are being made. And so, you know, speaking to Facebook and BizOps, like I was actually recruiting, you know, with um, Google and Facebook uh, in parallel where I had reached out to Google, had some prior networking connections just by virtue of my alumni base and past colleagues. Didn't have much connection to Facebook, but they were really expanding operations in, eight, um, in Austin. And traditionally it had been like sales, marketing, et cetera. But so essentially what happened is they reached out for biz ops role and I went through the interview process and it was actually a very interesting litmus test. I was like, am I what they want? Like I come from six, you know, whatever years of half a decade plus at at and and Dell, like, do they want me? Like, like, don't they want to pick up the person from Google or like Airbnb or who knows, right? Like all the, the laundry list. And like, I was pleasantly surprised that they really appreciated the skill set that I would bring in to, um, and my role has essentially evolved into, um, a leader of a, a set of people um, 
uh, overseeing strategy and planning for the uh, small business go-to-market. So in terms of, so Sarin, to directly answer your question, apologies for the long-winded context to get there, is that um, Facebook a couple years ago split its go-to-market sales team from just one sort of team to sort of small business and enterprise business. They made that split. And so small business was brand new. It was traditionally very underserved from all of the cross-functional support perspectives. So product, like biz ops, like all of those functions were fairly underinvested. They were often just like, kind of like you take your core enterprise content and then slightly modify it, customize it for small business applications. So this was the first time the company made a bet investment to be small business centric. And it's, it's funny how things have played out over the past couple of years. That is now the top line vision of the company. If you look, ask Facebook what its mission, it's to empower small businesses. Like that is the line. That is the first line that the company talks about now, you know? And so, you know, my role has essentially become, as I said, like I was probably the first, you know, the first handful of hires to uh, be this part of the business operations that that role, I won't regurgitate, but what I described before, the connectivity tissue, this strategic uh, sale of staff, um, chief of staff to sales. And so day-to-day is involved um, sort of setting up the business of the, ry- the rhythm of the business. The most foundational thing, how do you assess your business on a weekly basis? What analytical views do you consume? And then what decisions can you make in quarter to attain? And then now zooming out a little bit, there's more quarterly cadence of planning. Like how do you um, plan your headcount for sales? How do you goal them? What goals? And we also deal with some outsourced sales partners, like our, our indirect sales channel. So what goals do you want to set them? How do you equip them for success? You know, we'll have those kind of conversations. Um, and then there's like classic things business strategy, like North America, let's split it into verticals. Let's split it into geographies. What products fit what products don't like where do we have gaps like all those kind of conversations um and then the final piece and it's like kind of a massive overlay and it's it's been a big uh focus for me and you know my the team that i manage um is about what we're doing with user privacy so obviously can't delve into massive details it's massively public just go read apple and google's uh pr around this ios 14 google just came out and, and this is, I think this is the most key part, I would say. All the things I described are BAU responsibilities in BizOps. So like sales planning, sales goaling, um, marketing plans, like just the BAU work. But really how you stand out in BizOps, especially at a company like Fang, you need, here's some context. There's a lot of single points of failure at companies like Fang. We don't overstaff, right? And there is some hierarchy, but it really doesn't matter. It's every person has a very clear remit of impact that they could drive. So I sort of just put my hand up to be like, I'd love to be the voice of small businesses dealing with this fast transforming user privacy environment. And so I stepped up, I led my team through kind of working with a span of 40, 50 different people across many different functions to create a coherent plan to address this. And it's going to be an ongoing thing. It's almost this new environment is almost as monumental as the shift from desktop to mobile, from Facebook feed to Instagram, like this is that big for the company. Um, this, this is user privacy 2.0. This is brand new. And so I think a big part of my success has been it's, it's you have to be comfortable in the ambiguity. You have to be someone who is an engagement manager who's able to, as I said, influence with or without authority. I can command sort of my team of analysts and you know pro- program managers, but I can't necessarily just unilaterally dr- drive the other 30, 40 people in product marketing, in business marketing, in product, like general product, like, or sales, the list goes on of the cross functions. And so you need to show, you need to build trust. You need to show that you can connect disparate dots. And when, when you do that, a certain confidence um, is um, seen, like you, there are certain confidences expressed within you and you're allowed, you're given the reins to run with things. And so I would say BizOps is 50% sort of like keeping the lights on, making sure the rhythm of the business is good. But 50% is like identifying the biggest, highest revenue impact projects for your commercial organization. And then being the champion, interdisciplinary, cross-functional engagement manager. You're kind of stealing from consulting parlance. Yeah, that's great. I think you've kind of touched upon one, one key point that a lot of our, our guests have touched on that, um, you know, especially the ones that are kind of transitioning from undergrad or from, from business school into one of these sort of um, more, 
I mean, leadership roles, but not even just leadership roles, but very truly cross-functional roles where even if you have this like stellar idea or this area in which, you know, you think you can make this big impact in the company, you know, that's great, but good work isn't done, you know, by yourself. Right. And so there is this, this huge, um, huge skill to be able to like effectively influence, not just, you know, people on your team, but other, you know, units within the organization to kind of work towards this, this common goal. Right. And I think that's, that's how you can truly make, make impact in, in some of these, um, you know, sort of, uh, outbound facing roles or even just even in product right and you know i go through it all the time yeah um, but that's great um and do you mind do you mind expanding a little bit more on on um like one, one of the projects you're working on or how yeah. that kind of fits into to facebook's um you know sort of gargantuan set of products now um yeah of course absolutely um yeah, I'll, I'll keep it high level, but I think I can speak to mo more of the modus operandi of how do you do this? Like, how does it look in a company like Facebook? What, what skills are needed? How do you approach it? So the way it goes is the rhythm of the business surfaces some key problems. So like we're meeting the head of like small business sales, you know, and we'll be like, hey, we have this big rock of like iOS 14 changes coming that are going to impact our ability to run our business. So like our ability to understand at the core how best to serve our users, like relevant advertising and how best to serve our customers, i.e. advertisers with the, like being able to provide them with the most relevant set of traffic, right? And so I think initially it was such a new thing that we spent almost a quarter, I would say, going through discovery. And so a cross-functional team, like it first starts in a very research oriented setting. So like a team, like Mark, we have a team called marketing science, which is focused on the science of advertisers and their needs. And we have a data science team, which can kind of get into the nick gritty of like rev underliers, underlying factors, driving revenue or impairing revenue. So that's where it starts. Like very upstream, you get, you have this like kind of hodgepodge of like data and like research topics and points. But the problem is you need to bring it together. How does it all come together? And so what my role in that space has been was first, um, and I'll just take you through the project management. First was setting up pillars, right? So we set up a pillars where pillar one was insights and understanding. So this was your data science and analytical side of business operations, just running revenue analytics. Like, whoa, like where's the revenue? Where are the pieces of the revenue that are at risk? What is, what's secure, what needs to migrate to a new product or a new whatever solution, right? Then you have like a second, we had a, we had a second pillar, which was what we called um, essentially solution science. So what do we need to develop as new age solutions? So like, we'll do some like blocking and tackling in the near term to, you know, you know, make sure revenue is good or like good enough, but like what, cap what can we do in the long term to migrate advertisers to the ideal solutions to deal with this massive external change, right? It's pillar two. Um, pillar three was sales and element. I'll just leave it at that. Sales is just taking all of this stuff and packaging it up in a way that's easily digestible for our advertisers, right? So high level, you can almost just break that into kind of like biz ops analytics. You have a science teams at like some sort of, it could be advertiser science, it could be advertising science, that sort of a pillar, so research pillar. And then you have your sales pillar. So just like really like kind of structure yourself in a way where like you draft a task force of people, which is kind of borrowed time. No one was hired into Facebook necessarily. You know, if you think about how quickly these problems come, we're never hired against like a, a you know, fashion where we know what problem we're going to solve. The problems come and you have the, you have the black ops team. So, but the thing is, how do you direct this team? And so this organization, right? So you set up these pillars and then, uh, parallel to that, you have to also think about the horizontal overlays. So like, this is the core pillars of this, you know, task force, but there's going to be teams outside of your small business scope that go pan the whole company. So like, how do we think about the broader Facebook level, not the small business go to market, but the broader Facebook level, you know, um, product views, product strategies, corporate finances views on the goals that we need, like you kind of need to be, um, cognizant of like the broader company perspective. So there's horizontal connection points. And then, as I mentioned, just to re double back on the point to make, I was fortunate enough to sit in this central position, coordinating all these different moving parts, people on borrowed time, solving a weird problem that we don't like is new and is not clearly structured with clear measures of success. 
So that's the pillar. That's the initial project setup. Racy frameworks are so important. Who's responsible? Who's accountable? You know, who's uh, consulted and who's informed? Because you you need um you know you need to have that sort of uh, lines in the sand so that people are not like working on the same sorts of things. All right, cool. So uh, you you know you had talked a little bit about the organization that you work with. So I kind of want to uh, to to dive a little deeper and understand you know some of the different roles that you had mentioned that are yeah. in BizOps. So you you had mentioned program managers. You had mentioned analysts. Like, yeah. how does the typical BizOps organization look like? And and you know what's the career ladder there? It's great questions. Yeah. So um, the way it's set up is like it it the overarching structure of BizOps, and I'm kind of biased to the companies that I've worked at, but you know, I think it's decently representative. You're really thinking about how you um, person mark sales. So like a lot of your structure is informed by the sales structure. So like, for example, at Facebook, there is a global business group, which manages enterprise and very large medium business clients. So we're talking about clients that are spending like, you know, in the millions, you know, regularly on the online advertising platform. And then you'll have a global business group, BizOps team. So you can see the almost perfect. And then there's a small business group, which touches on the lower end of medium businesses and small businesses. And we have a small business group, BizOps team. So like just high level, it starts with really like mapping to sales. Once you get into the organization itself, um, this is where it gets interesting because like, you know, each company has its twist. At, at Facebook, um, you know, what you'll see is uh, it's, you know, the core role is sort of, oh, did we lose Sarin for a second there? Or are we still good? No, no, he just went off camera. Keep, keep okay, on. all good. Um, yeah, so just, you know, circling back um, to the Facebook structure of BPNO, it's called Business Planning and Operations here, uh, just a synonym for business, uh, biz ops. Um, you'll find uh, that, you know, it, the functional role doesn't change as you move levels. So like ultimately you're driving towards the same sort of mission of being a strategic advisor to the sales organization by also being, and then in parallel being connective tissue to all of those other functions that I've mentioned, um, you know, before, you know, product, marketing, finance, et cetera. And so to, to answer your question, touch roles, yes, you do come in at an analyst sort of level. Um, and your core role at that point is you're very, very focused on deep data. So this is where the skill sets that are required there is like, are you super comfortable with ambiguous data sets and often hard to extract data sets? Like these companies like Facebook, Airbnb, and I can keep going on that list of hyper growth companies. They, they grew so fast chasing kind of the next pot of revenue that like sometimes the data infrastructure is playing catch up. Sometimes we're, we're still like maturing in our own, uh, you know, data reporting capabilities. And so that's why it's so important for an analyst to be comfortable, like putting stuff out there. You're never going to have perfectly ticked and tied. This isn't banking. That's the first like kind of mindset you have to shift. Like it's best efforts. And it's like, as long as you have some methodology consistency, there is noise. Maybe there's a plus or minus 5% error band, but that's okay. Cause you're looking at directional trends. So you really, if, when you work back from the end goal of like strategically advising sales, you stop like obsessing over like, you know, rounding to the perfect decimal place. And so at those levels, the analyst levels, you, you take direction on, you know, leading analytical projects, like either setting up new reporting or continuing to do existing reporting, ultimately driving business insights. Being, I'm, as this, once again, being a bit of a generalized and reductive, but like I'm speaking to, I'd say the core ethos of each level. Now from there, you become program manager. This level is interesting because you're kind of like almost auditioning to share your capability to influence, you know, without authority, you're still an individual contributor but you might have an analyst who's like soft line reporting to you and you can leverage them for data needs. But now you're in that position where I'll be, I'll, I'll take a different approach here and be really slice of life. You have a meeting with the head of a specific sales unit. So maybe not global sales, maybe the head of North America sales. You have a 60 minutes with them and you're running a weekly business review. You have to drive as much impact as possible in those 60 minutes. This is where working smart becomes so key. You're not just putting data walls in front of them. You're not just, you know, talking about non-actionable trends. You are this meeting. The whole only goal of this meeting is to walk away with sales feeling confident about their plans in the near and medium term to hit their strategic goals and their and more 
tangibly their revenue numbers, their growth numbers, right? So that, so this 60 minutes, it's almost like this is where the science converts to art. What are you going to do? And every PM takes their twist on this. How do you want to run that meeting? How do you want to leverage your analysts? Who might you bring in as guest stars from some of these other pillars like product or finance or marketing, right? Like how are you going to put a intangible product experience, the 60 minute weekly experience, it's almost religious the way I'm talking about it, like such that sales walks away feeling, I know my business, I understand my business, I understand my customer, right? In the most generic sense, it's that classic role of getting smart about your business. It's a bit of a catchphrase in BizOps. Now from there and the kind of level where I'm operating now is you're, you, you will sort of cherry pick these extremely high impact pieces. So I've talked about user privacy. It's all over the news. And so this is where you kind of sometimes wear two hats. You do have to roll up your sleeves. There are times, right? Like, because it's so high stakes, you might need to put the final touches on a presentation document. You might need to double click into a data view, like sparingly, but um, really you're kind of making sure the BAU, like that weekly classic business review, the, the PM and the analysts that are managing it are like, on track, like you're providing feedback, you're sort of there as their kind of executive voiceover cover. You hope like senior PMs like figure it out for themselves. Like they're confident pushing back on sales or like, you know, holding their ground. But because of your experience, like, you know, I'm just like, you know, 10 years into my career, like, you know, been in this kind of managerial capacity for a couple of years. Like you, you build a kind of tone and cadence around the ability to manage tricky conversations. Like sales can be ruthless right? Like they can be ruthless. Like you can put so much I mean, blood, sweat, and tears into some of the work at the analyst and PM levels and like could just be completely ignored. It. And what happens is when you come up through banking, you uh, form a healthy detachment to your work product. Like the number of times I have pulled all nighters or worked through a weekend only for the deck to be completely 65 page deck to be completely glossed over in a meeting with a client. It's happened so many times that after a while, like you, you almost like focus on, let me control what I can control. So like, you know, and you have to have that same mindset here where like the ultimate imp goal is impact for like the business. It's not content, right? Or it's not how polished you sound in your presentation. And so I think like this level, once you step up into more of a formal or informal managerial capacity, you need to be kind of coaching with empathy you know, you need to be like showing, like uh, signaling these types of behaviors. So there's almost this like unofficial remit of like, you, the, the, and it kind of answers your final uh, question, which is like, what does that career progression look like? Your, your, the, your success is continu um It's almost weird. You almost want your, you know, down leveled resources to super, like kind of be able to manage your core remit. Like you've coached them or you've like trained them up to a point where they're like in a position to be autonomous of you. It's weird. It's counterintuitive. But it really, I think in these newer companies, it's not the iron fisted draconian, like time management time, like, you know, kind of like, you know, management style. Instead, it's more about like, what can I do to empower and drive the growth of the folks underneath me? And then I think that just continues to ripple. So like, it's, that's the base um, view. You rise in the organization in a way such that you're, you're, you've proven that you empower the folks below and build their career and give them a pathway and give them headroom. And then secondarily, the scope of the problems that you do spend your day-to-day -day on, like what you're thinking about and stuff, just become higher and higher stakes. You're just a lot more focused on, I'd say, steer co, steering committee work, which is like, hey, we have 13 weeks ahead of us. Like, what are the big rock things that like the business needs to focus on? And like, are is everyone moving in that direction? And you're kind of like steering that at that level. And you're kind of trusting that like the week-to-week -week business review numbers and like the, the go-to-market plans that are BAU are running smoothly. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for walking us through that kind of progression of, um, you know, what it might look like for someone who's just entering the organization or, or earlier in their career. And, and as you kind of move up, how you think about things differently, how you think about spending your time differently and how you think about, you know, your overall team's objectives. Um, and I think that that goes true for, I think, a lot of roles within within the organization, right? Um, just generally speaking, when you come in and you might be a few years of experience or earlier in your career, and, you know, at least this is from my experience working, uh, you know, not in, in banking or consulting, but at a, at a tech company, you might be super focused on one kind of very singular project or, or feature or capability. 
And then as you kind of grow and as you kind of, you know, get more experience, that scope begins to expand and that impact begins to expand, you know, both for, for the customer, but, you know, also very importantly for the business, right? And so you're not thinking about these narrow little blockers, but you're thinking about, well, how can I make this, this larger impact for the, for the business as a whole, right? And, and a lot of that, as you're mentioning, is utilizing, you know, the other teams within, within your organization, either laterally or, or that are working for you. Um, so that's great. Um, so now you've, you've been in this biz ops function. You, you seem to have a, a very, very strong, strong lens of, of how to do this, um, you know, not just at Facebook, but, but at, at prior organizations successfully. Um, how do you see yourself kind of um, growing from here? Or, or what do you think kind of, you know, um, your sort of next transition is? Or, or how do you, you yeah. know, how do you kind of put that together? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, it depends on what you want. So I've seen, uh, I'll try to I hate saying a number before I start talking and then the ideas don't map, but let's just say three rough pathways, right? So like, there's one pathway that you love biz ops. And you just continue to ascend the ranks and you're ahead of business operations for whatever organization or company you're in. Like, so you're staying within your function and you're just scope and just keeps rising and rising with time and tenure. And it's not like time basic. You really have to prove yourself because as with any organization, it kind of narrows out as you get higher. The other thing you can do is like, especially these tech companies, you can jump into an adjacent sort of function. So like I work extremely close with business product marketing. It's probably my favorite cross-functional partner. So this is the partner that's pretty close to product. And so core product at the company and they're, but they're articulating, you know, business product marketing needs for the specific go-to-market that they're serving. So enterprise business, small business, right? So you can kind of look at tangent uh, functions to jump into. And you're just, at this point, your, your game plan at the company is almost like, becoming like, let me show and exhibit a capability to work across a bunch of different functions. Um, maybe even sales, like sales at Facebook is a place that you can definitely slot into even coming from like a business operations world. Um, it's a lot more fluid. It's not as classic as the older companies where you need that kind of account management background and ground level experience, right? So like you can definitely think about some roles within core sales right? Um, whether they're the customer facing or they're more internal strategies. So in a nutshell, you look at adjacencies like sales, product, um, marketing even, and move in that direction. The third thing that you do is like, if you just really love what you're doing and you're not like, you want to continue increasing your scope, you kind of look at smaller, less mature companies, right? So like you could like uh, potentially like after some years of proving your metal at like a what let's call it like an industry leading company, like we're talking $500 billion, trillion dollar companies. And you've gotten, you've gained a sufficient experience. Like you might be like, you know, it, it make a bid for like head of X function operationally at a smaller company. And then one day potentially be COO. Right. So I think like the biz ops path is perfectly set up for you to become COO um, at, of some organization. If that's what, you know, you want to do with your life. Um, and I think the other thing, and this is, this isn't directly answering your question, but I think it's an important consideration for people is like, you know, like there's these companies and it's an internal thing. They're trying, like I've heard of Facebook and I think it happens at Google as well. They're trying to set up career paths for folks that like being individual contributors. There's some people, and that has existed on the tech side for a long time. You can become level six, seven, eight, nine, and you're a super senior software engineer. Who's like a, like kind of architect level person. But that has not traditionally existed on business roles. It's weird. Like you don't, it's hard to specialize to that degree. So I think they're trying, it's not going to be an overnight transformation, but they're trying to build a culture where folks who are good at what they do as like a senior program manager could, you know, potentially continue on at that level, maybe moving to different parts of the business, especially with these large cap companies having a lot of different product areas and a lot of different like sales go-to-market differences, like enterprise versus small or product. Like I'm doing online advertising core, but there's also Facebook reality labs with all the AR VR products. So like you can sort of move around and build a career that way as well. And like, I think that's starting to emerge, like, because not everybody wants to become a team leader or people manager. Right. And, and traditionally it's been a very touchy topic. Like how do you communicate that without sounding like someone who's not ambitious, you know, and someone who's just sort of like punching in, punching out, um, and I un unfortunately think that's still the case, like at a lot of the older companies, like, you know, like you can sort of, 
feel an up or out culture or like you feel like you're stagnating like it's they might keep you at a certain level but you won't feel great because they're not working on keeping the job interesting and expanding scope in other creative ways that don't necessarily mean people management right and I, I think like these newer tech companies are taking lead on articulating and um, building that culture and a and a tangible plan awesome yeah 100 percent agree uh and and i love that last point that you have um, this was this was a ton of great information, Chandra, about BizOps and working at at Goldman, working at Dell, AT and T, and now Facebook. Um, would just love to end on, you know, yeah. is there any advice that you'd give anybody who is looking to break into BizOps or get into BizOps? You know, what what is your last parting advice that you have for them? Yeah, look, I I'm biased. Maybe I'm old school. I know a lot of people are like chasing those tech unicorn monies and like, you know, trying to join a whatever series A series B company. Like if that's what you want to do, do it for the right reasons. Right. Please like make sure you believe in the company, the product, the type. It's tricky. Right. Because when you go to those unstructured type companies, like so early on in your career, like the training you get may or may not be transferable. But one thing I can tell you is banking and consulting continue to provide hyper transferable skill sets, especially. And I think this conversation has been very non-product oriented. So I hope you have other guests who touch on the product mar marketing manager or product manager roles. It's just not my world. I come from a world where I didn't grow up like a, like a techophile and like super interested in like reverse engineering technological products and solutions. So for I'm speaking to that audience, get your training. Like really don't hyper obsess. Here's a, here's a, maybe I'm being a bit too candid. You're not going to get enough equity at L1 to matter, you know, like, so unless you're joining this company and ascending to a senior level of like, you know, manager, lead director, and you picking the right bet that like the company that you chose is going to be that next darling, you know, the pre IPO valued in the billions you're, you're, you're taking a much riskier path from both a career skill development perspective, as well as honestly, if it's, that's what matters to your compensation perspective, because it may not pan out. Um, and I've, and I have friends at some of these kind of pre IPO younger companies that are like facing that reality 18 months in. So I would say there's a lot of media stigma around, Oh, like finance is dead consulting. Like why bother? Just go, you know, go chase your tech millions. I think that's a really short sighted way couple things we y2k happened in our lifetimes we're not that young and um, so you know this like who knows when there might be a course correction for um for tech as it is now i'm not saying it's the fourth industrial revolution isn't a real thing there might be stutters getting there so i would just say for people not to obsess about like the friend that they hear about who's like gotten 10x 20x on their equity package as like a governing way in which they're guiding their career but instead focus, as I said, on the key skills you want to develop. And I would say coming on the biz op side, it's really, look, it's, it's assumed it's table stakes. You're good analytically, do your SQL, do your Tableau, do your, you know, macros, get all that down, whatever way you need to, but that's just table stakes. That's not special work on influencing without authority, work on thinking like one to two levels above you. This was, this was awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, thanks again. And I hope you listeners enjoyed. If you have any feedback, uh, feel free to fill out our link in the description below. And, um, you know, happy to hear about any topics that you're interested in, in learning. Or, um, you know, we could also include Chund Chundra's uh, uh, contact information in the, in the uh, description as well. If you want to reach out to him, uh, send him an email, um, uh, message him on LinkedIn. But thanks again, listeners, and I uh, hope you all enjoy. Peace. Thanks.